Okay. Right. Just give me a second. Chintan, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're live on YouTube as well. I hope everybody can see the screen. Right now, if Chintan wants to convey something to me, he's going to do that on the audio. Uh, I can't really see the chat box at present and I'm going to flip through the slides. So like I said, today we're talking on reading radiographs of the knee. Uh, what do we want to see in these x-rays per se? So a simple anterior posterior view, a lateral x-ray, and people must have heard of a skyline view of the patella, the three common x-rays that everyone talks about. And when we talk of the AP view, what we're trying to look at are the four bones essentially. That's the patella, that's the kneecap in the front, femur on the top, tibia below, and the fibula right next to it. And what we are concerned about is, uh, are the paths of these bones themselves. So on the femoral side, we're looking at the medial femoral condyle, the lateral femoral condyle, the medial tibial plateau, the lateral tibial plateau. Now on the tibial side, there's something in the center apart from these two plateaus. And we call that the intercondylar area. That's the intercondylar eminence. Next, when we look at the lateral X-ray, um, what we are looking at is again the patella, the femur and the tibia. And what are we trying to see over here? We can see the outlines of something below the patella extending to the tibial tuberosity. That's the patella tendon. We can see something that's extending superior to the patella and that's the quadriceps femoris tendon or the quadriceps tendon as such. And we are also looking at subtle soft tissues shadows that give us uh, different signs and we'll talk about those. If you can notice over here on the right hand side, we pointed out the difference between the anterior suprapatellar fat pad and the posterior suprapatellar fat pad. So you can see on the x-ray on the left that there's a thin uh, hyper intense shadow on the superior aspect of the patella and that's actually the joint fluid. So it's it's minimal, say two to five cc in normal knees. And this entire space at the top anterior to the femur is gonna get filled up if there is fluid in the knee. The third X-ray that we are looking at, you can see at the bottom is a skyline view. And the skyline view gives us uh, the nature of the patellofemoral joint. And that's something that we are not gonna deep talk about today because the patellofemoral joint is uh, an anatomical structure of its own and much of the pathophysiology or the pathology that goes with the PFJ, it's a detailed discussion that requires an R on its own. Though basic skyline views, what we are looking at is uh, the shape of the patella and uh, there's a classification on the types of patellas that we see that's called the Weiberg classification. You can look it up, W-I-B-E-R-G. And uh, essentially, you want to know what's the lateral side and what's the medial side and how the medial uh, patella facet is articulating with the trochlea and how the lateral facet is articulating with the trochlea. Uh, the, a note on the pictures at the top of the screen. If you're seeing a slightly rotated lateral view, it is imperative to know which is the medial femoral condyle and which is the lateral femoral condyle. And there are two keys here. Number one, and I personally use this one. You can see it better on the left-hand side image. If you follow the two condyles on the posterior side, then on the posterior cortex, one of the two has a small protuberance and that's called the adductor tubercle. That's where the adductor uh, 
Magnus attaches and you can see that there's a small cortical prominence there and that one's only on the medial femoral condyle. It's a great marker or which is your medial side. The other marker of course has been pointed out uh, on the right hand side that's the lateral femoral notch. So there's a small indentation always on the lateral femoral condyle which isn't present on the medial femoral condyle ever and that can again give you sort of uh, a clue as to which the lateral side is. Okay, so this is the only colored slide of the presentation. Again, to just give you a three-dimensional idea of how the femur, tibia, fibula, and the patella play with each other. You can see it from the front, from an oblique point of view, where you can see again on the medial femoral condyle, there's a small protuberance as it uh, goes on to the posterior cortex, and that's the adductor prominence. It will always be seen on X-rays. So if you're taking a slightly oblique view, not a true lateral, then you'll be able to make out with the help of this prominence. And uh, you can see the other parts that the tibia has an anterior protuberance called the tibial tuberosity. Uh, you see that the fibular head is not at the same level as the top of the tibia. It's about a centimeter lower. Um, you can also see that the tip of the patella as well is slightly higher and above the level of the tibia. So certain basic characteristics remain the same for all knees, though there are individual variations. Like you can see in this image, now this is what we call as a true AP and a true lateral. What do I mean by a true image? So a true radiograph means it's exactly how we want and how we want the AP is we want the patella facing forwards right in the center and we want the fibula being bisected by the tibia. So you can see that the fibula, fibular head, uh, if you trace it above, it goes in line with the lateral tibial plateau cortex. So that's what a true AP is and you can make out all the bony landmarks on this X-ray. Same thing on the lateral side. If you have a horizontal beam lateral, or a cross table lateral, what you're looking at is overlap of the femoral condyles. That's the most important thing to see. And if there's a good femoral condylar overlap, then you will be able to see certain marginal patellofemoral space as well. That again tells you that this is a good lateral X-ray. Another thing to note, most lateral X-rays, we prefer them to be taken in around 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. Though if you have, uh, say an acute trauma to the knee and the knee is very painful, then patients would be very averse to bending the knees. So then across uh, a horizontal beam lateral of in, in extension is also acceptable. In fact, most of the times if you want to pick up hemarthrosis in the knee, then uh, just horizontal projections of the lateral in extension are much better than the flexed knee position. All the markings over here are self-explanatory, but I'm assuming that you already know the parts of the knee. We also must look at adolescent and pediatric x-rays very differently uh, with the patellofemoral joint. This is one thing that I'm not going to cover in the presentation. Uh, I some Something's wrong with my cursor. So just in case people want to write up in the chat box, uh, Chintan's going to convey it to me on our personal WhatsApp or is going to uh, talk about it during the presentation. Otherwise, I'm going to finish all of this and then come back to answer doubts. Right. So when we're looking at pediatric population and adolescents, it's important to note that they have an epiphysis, a growth plate, uh, the metaphysis. And this distinction is important because all pediatric injuries would then get classified into Salter-Harris types. Most of the times, the knee as such uh, does not witness anything. Yes, sorry to interrupt you. You can annotate if you want. That will be visible. That will be easier for. Yeah. So there's something's off with my cursor. Okay. I'm okay. trying to annotate. No. Uh, but okay. I, I'm not able to see my cursor at all. Okay. So there's it. not much that needs the cursor as such. Most of the images have uh, labels. But if I struggle okay. a bit, then I'm going to try and look for the cursor again. Okay. Yeah. 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 Perfect. So like I was saying, most adolescent tibial plateau fractures are Salter-Harris type 5 types where there's a lot of facial injury, but you can't see the condyles breaking off. Of course, there are certain very peculiar avulsion fractures seen and we'll talk about those. But it's important to note that 
you have to treat those with growth remaining that means uh, by far and large all boys that are less than 16 and all girls that are less than 14 in a different way because they have a growing limb there and the knee is their predominant part of growth and you can't treat them like adults most problems around the knee are divided into three parts so there is something can break any of those four bones the femur tibia uh, the patella or the fibula can break or the soft tissues surrounding them and inside them can tear and that's trauma then all of these things can grow old so when these uh, soft tissues around the knee and the joint per se grows old we've coined it arthritis and when the bone grows old then it loses collagen and we call that osteoporosis and of course bone can also lose calcium and vitamin d and that's osteomalacia but on the radiographs on the x rays uh, we have a generic common term that's called osteopenia that means the bone doesn't look the same and that's the bone growing old so the bone grows old and the joint grows old and everything else is some amount of inflammation so there may be rheumatoid arthritis uh, various different types of inflammatory arthritis including gout and calcium pyrophosphate disease there may be infection there may be polyvalvular nodular synovitis and hundreds of other things now everything that breaks and tears that's trauma we should be able to uh, pick up on x rays and mri that's uh, radiology anything that grows old as far as arthritis is concerned we'd like to pick up on the x rays not even go for mris and as far as the bones are concerned again we can pick them up on the x rays if the bone is growing old if there's osteopenia but of course we'd like to supplement with investigations like a dexa scan or trying to get their alkaline phosphatase and calcium and phosphorus and other serum markers as far as inflammation is concerned uh, that's Uh, that spectrum of disease is better picked up with serological investigations so we would like our blood markers there and radiology plays a lesser role unless uh, things have moved way ahead in the disease and uh, things are evident on the x rays themselves so most of the presentations then when we talk about knee radiology uh, learning things reading radiographs of the knee we're talking about things that have broken up in and around the knee and we are going to pick that up on the x ray and if the knee joint per se grows old then we can pick it up on the x ray so what are the problems associated with trauma and there are uh, a handful of things say around 10 things that you should remember and note and if you can pick these up on the x rays then you'll be subjecting a lot of less a lot less patients to the mri and you'll be missing you will be less likely to miss out on multiple diagnoses so when you have a patient with a limb injury a knee injury when do you get an x ray done you see a 35 year old female who's fallen down while running the mumbai marathon and comes to you with anterior knee pain so do you do an x ray for this patient if that's the question that comes to your mind then you should remember these four points because the only indications for x rays in clinical practice that is evidence based is if the patient can't walk four steps in front of you that's inability to bear weight on the affected limb if there is an isolated tenderness at the palpable bones so what is really palpable is the patella always and if this if somebody is fallen right on their patella or their kneecap then they may be having a subtle fracture there so you must palpate the patella and the other thing you can really palpate well is the fibular head that's on the lateral side of your leg and if there is an isolated tenderness at the patella or the fibula head uh, then you should subject the patient to an x ray also if there is no great range of motion if it's absolutely restricted or it can't go beyond 90 that's an indication for an x ray and of course we'd be uh, we'd like to diagnose the fragile population much earlier so anybody less than 12 or 14 and anybody more than 50 uh, can't really may not really be able to subjectively describe their symptoms so we are going to rely on x rays and mri more so in that population what all can we see on the x ray so if you have a patient with inability to bear weight and can't move around the limb and has fallen down from a 12 foot tank and has pain 
So you're going to get an AP and a lateral view done. And of course, the patient can't move the leg. So there's no question of bending the knee. So there's a lateral taken in extension. And what you can see here is what you need to look for is the suprapatellar space. That means the space between the patella and the anterior cortex of the femur. And most of the times, it's blackish in layman terms. And when it gets filled up with something white, then that's fluid over there. Now, if you have any of the bones breaking, then the bone splits up and bone marrow comes out. And bone marrow has fat and it has blood cells. Fat is really hypo-intense and it's almost the same as the black of the presentation slide background. So it's black, black, black. And fluid, of course, is somewhere between the white of the bone uh, and the white of the other soft tissues. So you can see on the slide right in front where there's a clear cut level and you can see fat and blood both over there. And that's called lipo, that's fat, hematrosis, collection of blood. And you can see the tibia on the left hand side and there appears to be a tibial plateau fracture there. So if there is any fracture in the tibia, the femur or the patella, patella less likely, then you're going to be able to see this in almost 50% of the cases. Of course, many a times uh, these patients have violent injuries and you're going to pick up fractures per se directly on the AP and the lateral views. But there are some, some, some patients where you can't really see an obvious fracture. There's just a hairline. And this is one of those subtle markers uh, we call it the FBI sign. So that's fat blood interface. If you can see the fat blood interface, then it's not an ACL injury. It's not a PCL injury. It's not a meniscal injury. Something's broken, not bone. So there's a bone injury there. Of course, most other intra-articular knee injuries where you're assuming that the femur, the tibia and the patella are normal. And it's the soft tissues that have uh, the soft tissues that have suffered damage, and that can include the menisci, the cartilage, or the ligaments. Then you're going to see just blood. There's no fat there. It's just the blood that's coming out of those tiny vessels that may have broken at that time, and uh, that's seen as a hyper intense shadow in front of the anterior cortex of the femur. So that's hematrosis. Next, you must very carefully look at the tibiofemoral articular surfaces and the alignment. What I mean by alignment is not the hip, knee and the ankle alignment because you can't really assume what that would be on a short AP film. But like you can see, we, we must always draw this one line from the lateral femoral condyle to the lateral tibial plateau. On the outer side, you can see this line there. And if this line has played, if the tibial plateau has suffered a, an articular side fracture. That's not significant. Maybe even orthopedic surgeons miss it out. If you follow these guidelines and you see that there's playing of the tibial plateau more than 5 mm, then it's very indicative of, uh, of an articular tibial plateau fracture. The other thing that you need to very carefully see is the surface of the tibia itself. Same goes for the surface of the femur. And sometimes if you just have a small osteochondral injury, uh, you're just going to see a small divot at some point and that's your first key to pick up before you subject the patient to a CT scan or something else. So we're thinking of CT scans for most bone evaluations and MRIs for, for the soft tissue evaluations. But it's very important to pick up what's gone wrong predominantly, whether it's bone or soft tissue, so that the patient's next investigation can be chosen. If the patient's tibia and femur, the articular surfaces are normal, then you're next looking at uh, certain other parts of the tibia that have come off. So what all can come off, you can see on the top right, there's the ACL and the PCL, and the ACLs attached between the two uh, intercondylar eminences towards the front end of the tibia, and the PCL is attached right behind. What you can see in the x-rays is on the left hand side, the ACL coming off the tibia and on the right hand side, the PCL coming off the posterior part of the tibia. So these are ACL and PCL avulsions. You must look for them because 
yes most patients do have hemarthrosis some of them have come to you after 2 weeks or 3 weeks where the hemarthrosis has subsided and some other clinician may have considered these x rays to be normal and before you subject the patient to an mri you must remember that these avulsions are actually better picked up and better classified on x rays themselves so my surgical treatment for an acl avulsion uh we use a classification called as mckeever and the modified mckeever classification is uh, better represented by an x ray than an mri so my surgical decision most of on relies on the x ray than the mri what we do is if there's an acl avulsion we we'll arthroscopically uh fix it with sutures and try and pull them down and see if you can see on the left hand side image the acl has come off with a bone fragment from the tibia and we try and push it back in place with uh, with an arthroscopic suture bridge fixation without having to open the patient same thing with the pcl as well there are two three ways of fixing it uh, earlier we used to have a small posterior approach and fix these avulsions but now we can do them arthroscopically with a suture bridge fixation the other type of avulsion that you must remember oh, before we come to that this photograph is uh, put in place to remind everyone that when we are looking at the pediatric or the adolescent population we don't see soft tissue acl injuries 90% of the acls that we see in this population say between 10 and 15 years is an acl avulsion so it's uh, the soft tissue of the acl is not the weak point in these bachus so it's it's the apophysis that's attaching over there and that comes off so most of the acl avulsion work that we do is in the adolescent population you must remember that this is an injury that you must pick up on the x rays in these kids so again this gives us in detail of what has happened to this patient you can see the acl and it's attached to this uh, intercondylar eminence only the part where the acl is attached can come off or sometimes rarely in these cases you can see that the entire intercondylar eminence fragment so it's a huge chunk and may not be able to fix with just one screw as such and may require something else the entire chunk everything between the two plateaus has come off the tibia again very common and seen in adolescents then what else gets avulsed off the tibia and the fibula so you can see on the left hand side uh, on the lateral side of the tibia we have the gerdes tubercle where the iliotibial band attaches and we have the lateral collateral ligament that's the lcl that uh, moves from the lateral femoral condyle to the fibula between these two so that's between the lcl and the gerdes tubercle itb there's the anterolateral capsule or recently described by belamons the anterolateral ligament and the anterolateral ligament attaches uh, to this part of the tibial plateau between the fibula and the gerdes tubercle and sometimes when you have uh, an acl injury that involves a larger pivot of the knee then this fragment from the tibia comes off and that we call as a segens fracture and we'll see the x rays of this one again on the lateral side itself the fibula head is one epicenter of lot of attachments so it has the lcl like we just spoke of it has the popliteo fibular ligament it has the biceps femoris insertion and at any point if there is traction on any one of these ligaments it's going to take the head of the fibula off like you can see in this x ray so apart from acl and pcl avulsions in a traumatic patient where there is no obvious femoral condyle or tibial plateau fracture you must look for fibula head avulsions and you must look if not the fibula then the lateral tibial plateau must be seen very carefully to see if a chip has come off like you can see in this x ray on the left and that's a segens fracture a segens fracture is an avulsion injury of the anterolateral capsule tibial attachment or the anterolateral ligament tibial attachment of the tibial plateau and it's seen just like this 
Most of the times we conserve these second fractures because the predominant injury in the patient is an ACL with certain other intraarticular injuries and those are tackled. But if it's really displaced and the patient has a great three pivot shift, then we would go in and fix the seconds as well. Uh, I don't have a picture right now, but I would also like to mention that there's something called as a reverse seconds as well. So something on the opposite side on the medial tibial plateau, if a chip comes off, then that's a different pattern of the injury. Uh, what I'm trying to say is you must look at the rims. So avulsions don't only mean that the cruciates come off the tibia in the center. Please look at the rims as well. Look at the fibula head and look at the lateral tibial plateau and the medial tibial plateau if a bone chip has come out. Now, uh, apart from these, uh, we have also come across patients that have uh, that ha clinicians have missed trying uh, missed the diagnosis, and that's related to the extensor mechanism. So, if a patient comes with a road traffic accident with inability to bear weight on that limb and uh, some amount of effusion, if you get an X-ray done and you can't see the tibial plateau or the femoral condyle going wrong, you almost always assume that. Uh, there is no bony injury, but it's very important to look at the lateral x-rays and make sure that the patient's extensor mechanism is intact. Many a times, uh, so there are two x-rays over here. The one right in the center shows that the distance between the patella and the tibial tuberosity is really increased. That means there is a patella tendon avulsion. And the one on the extreme right shows that the patella has come down a bit and it could possibly indicate a quadriceps tendon injury. So this segment of patients, I mean, the, uh, this group cohort of patients on the right with a quadriceps tendon injury, most of the times don't have great amount of hemarthrosis. Uh, they are able to extend the knee because the retinaculum hasn't broken and the patella doesn't move down great amounts. So the X-ray on the right hand side almost looks normal. But it's very important to see these patients clinically and you'll be able to see the feel the dimple just above the patella. So you must look for patella tendon avulsions or tears and you must look for quadriceps tendon injuries. On the left hand side, you can see this x-ray with the insol salvati index. Uh, essentially what insol said was if you can measure the patella and uh, if you can measure the patella tendon, then the patella tendons length must be around 20% plus or minus the length of the patella. Of course, we have better markers these days and as orthopedics, like uh, few of us focusing on the PFJ, uh, we use something called as the Blackburn peel or the Keton Deschamps ratio and many other markers, but that's beyond the purview of this presentation. Look for patella tendon ruptures, look for quadriceps tendon injuries. Next, if you have adolescence, uh, just touching on this because we've seen these as well. So you have a patient with tibial tuberosity pain and he's a 13 year old playing for a school football team. And you previously diagnosed this patient as an Osgood Schlatter's. Now, if there's a sudden eccentric contraction of the quadriceps, then the fragmented tibial tuberosity, uh, the tibial tuberosity fragments can come off and then that means you have an avulsion of the tip tuberosity that you need to tackle. Uh, you can fix these, but the idea is to look for it. So if you look at the x-ray, if there was no white arrow involved, you would just think of this as a normal x-ray with the patient having an Osgood Schlatter's. But no, this is an avulsion and it would be associated with point tenderness at that point and the patient giving you the complaints. And you need to pick these up. Now we need to look at other certain other markers which can confuse us. One of them is the fabella. That's a sesamoid in the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. I have uh, many of my colleagues coming down and asking me about, hey, what's, is this something broken inside the knee? Uh, but it's not. It's a normal finding or a variant. What you can see on the right hand side are the different variants of a fabella. So A is... Uh, something that we see very routinely on the lateral x-ray. And we must remember the fabella is best picked up on a lateral, just behind the femoral condyle. And you can see B where it's a little flattened out and sclerosed. And C and D where it almost looks like an osteophyte. And 
it it is sort of an extension of an osteophyte where the sesamoid has grown on to become bigger as the patient's got arthritis what you can see on the left hand side marked with the black arrows actually uh, is a fibula with a fracture so this is a rare entity but it has been described so if you have patients with uh, everything looking normal the mri also showing no bone marrow edemas and all the ligaments being okay and the patient has great pain on the posterolateral aspect of the knee you must look for something like this it's most of the times missed out on the mris because the films don't go far back or uh, they just have bigger cuts involved so the slices just miss the fibula and the x-ray can pick it up what's a lamella lamella is uh, a sesamoid in the popliteus uh, most of the times better picked up on the ap again a normal finding and it's right around the popliteal groove on the femur so you can see one on the x ray that's come up on the screen next when you're looking at patella fractures or you're suspecting a patella fracture you must remember that a segment of the population has something we call as a bipartite patella uh, again this is an ossification normal anomaly but a normal variant where you can see the suprolateral aspect of the patella is a separate fragment but it's not actually fractured off and there are rare case reports where uh, the bipartite fragment can fracture as well and it has been fixed or the bipartite fracture can be perennially painful and there are treatment techniques for that but don't confuse it as an acute patella fracture on the right hand side you can see an x ray that looks almost normal except for a fragment that's seen on the medial side of the medial femoral condyle very close to the medial femoral epicondyle so that's an ossification of the femoral insertion of the mcl so the mcl the medial collateral ligament would uh, attach on the femur close to the medial femoral condyle and uh, it's one of the commonest injuries femoral mcl injuries are one of the common sports injuries seen most of the times conserved many a times patients don't even reach their docs they just have persistent pain that goes away over a period of 2 to 3 weeks now if you have a chronic mcl lesion that means the mcl has healed on its own then over a period of time there can be ossification at its femoral insertion and this is called a pellegrini stader lesion this is again not something no bone that's come off nothing acute not related to any acute trauma but just uh, ossification of a chronic mcl uh, tear from the femur so for these chronic issues essentially acl pcl mcl and lcl instabilities uh, we do special stress cues and we won't go into those but there are specific parameters already established where we compare the valgus opening of the left and the right side we compare the movement of the tibia over the femur of the left and right side and judge uh, uh, the instability and the direction in which it's present there are certain other x rays we also take when we faced with chronic trauma so especially in a revision acl scenario it's not the mri that allows us to formulate the plan we also see long leg sagittal x rays like you can see right in the center so the posterior tibial slope plays a very important factor in the treatment offered to the patient if the patient is undergoing a revision acl also the long leg alignment so somebody with a varus alignment or a valgus alignment would be offered something other and in addition to arthroscopy itself in the adolescent age group you can see the x ray of the hand and this is very peculiar because when we want to offer treatment between uh, 11 and 15 then apart from knee x rays we always get the x ray of the hand and there's a way to determine the amount of growth that's pending and that affects our treatment and management now other than this if you're not looking at trauma and you're looking at chronic conditions that involve inflammation and arthritis the difference is that we want all the x rays to be standing why standing because if you go on to get a ct or an mri done that's going to be in supine position and we want to judge how the cartilage and how the meniscus is playing under load bearing conditions under dynamic conditions hence the ap and the lateral preferably should be in a standing position uh 
I have written about Rosenberg X-rays, and you can see the picture on the left about how a Rosenberg is taken compared to a plain AP. There is there are certain schools of thought that talk about the Rosenberg being very helpful to pick up early arthritis. We don't use them routinely in my practice, and I have a little different view. I personally would prefer just a standing AP and a true lateral for the tibiofemoral joint. And of course, a skyline view and certain other views for the PFJ. And we won't discuss the PFJ right now. Why is the beam angled at 10 degrees to the horizontal while taking an AP? That's because the normal tibial slope is around between 5 and 10 degrees. So the posterior tibial slope is around 5 and 10 degrees. So if you don't angle the beam and take an AP X-ray, then you are not going to see the profile of the tibial plateau flat. You're going to see the tibial plateau rotated and then you're going to erroneously comment that there is arthritis. So this is what I'm talking about. In an ideal situation, we want the X-ray to look like the figure on the left. And because most of the X-rays that we take are taken in the non-acceptable format, it's very easy for all of us to label most of our patients as early arthritis. Even patients with anterior knee pain, that's essentially a patellofemoral complaint. If you get a tibiofemoral x-ray done, you're going to get it in this non-acceptable format and you'll have orthopedic surgeons and certain other people labeling it as early arthritis. And that should be avoided. Same thing with the skylines as well. And there's a way to take these skylines out. We won't go into that. This is another thing that you should look out for. Certain patients, uh, especially above 40, you're going to look at this x-ray and there is joint space. There is no joint space narrowing, but you can see stuff inside the knee and you're going to be prompted to think of these as osteophytes and you're going to label this candidate arthritic as well because that's the best diagnosis we have for almost everything around the knee. But you must remember if the patient's asymptomatic. This is just calcium pyrophosphate deposition in the menisca in the cartilage. And it's normal, it's normal, it's not arthritis. So when you're thinking of the problem as arthritis, again, standing X-rays are mandatory. And what you're looking for is joint space narrowing and osteophytes. If you can see joint space narrowing and osteophytes, subchondral sclerosis is a given, but uh, we, for our clinical practice, we never go into trying to label them into a kelgren lorenz grade one, two, three, and four, and all of that. We just want to know whether it's bone on bone. That means all the cartilage and meniscus between the joint has been destroyed or it's not bone on bone because the treatment depends on that. So for all those who are thinking uh, whom to offer an HTO and whom to offer a UKR. So we offer a UKR only for all those patients who are bone on bone. And these are certain guidelines. So a standing X-ray with the tibial plateaus in profile must show bone on bone. If it's not bone on bone and the joint space has reduced, oh, there are multiple other things, including a high tibial osteotomy that we can offer to the patient. Also, for a partial knee replacement, we're looking at an intact ACL and that can be indirectly judged on a lateral X-ray. So we're looking for anteromedial arthritis if there is any postromedial arthritis, that means the medial tibial plateau on the posterior side is uh, has erosions, then it's a contraindication for a UKR. We would go in for a total knee replacement. Also, we take in valgus stress views. What are we trying to look in when we see these valgus stress views of the knee in AP? One, we want to ensure that on the lateral side, there's nothing wrong. So the lateral joint should not collapse on a valgus stress. And second, the medial side should open up. So what I'm trying to say is uh, Oxford partial knee replacements have narrow criteria and they're all on x-rays. Partial knee replacements don't need MRIs. We use standard AP and valgus stress x-rays and have very strict criteria and if the patient falls in these criteria, then we offer them a partial knee. Not all candidates are, uh, not all patients are candidates for a partial knee. The incidence of offering a high tibial osteotomy to a patient and a partial knee is almost the same. That means uh, uh, we, we don't do more partial knee replacements and less total knee replacements and so on and so forth. 
uh, that's what I wanted to convey. Of course, there are so many other things uh, that we can discuss, but I'll take in your doubts right now, and then maybe we can use the other sessions to cover other points. Yeah, Mithen, excellent talk. You uh, explain everything very much in detail. Uh, and uh, I would just like to bring to everybody's notice that we are focusing on sports related injuries and degenerative changes. Obviously, there are uh, neoplastic changes. Also. I could have spoken on cortical defects and a lot of other things. But again, that's uh, a discussion in itself. Uh, involves a lot of issues. For example, we see, again, I keep talking about adolescence because we handle the uh, arthroscopy department at SRCC hospital as well. And we see children coming in with knee x-rays and the discussion for oncology, for example, and certain cortical defects for adolescents and adults go hand in hand and they are totally different. What you can think of as a giant cell tumor or an osteoclastoma in an adult is just a cortical de a desmoid in an adolescent. So exactly. we, we, we can take these questions later. I mean, or we can take a separate presentation on that. But this essentially focused just on uh, trauma. There's a completely different discussion on arthritis again, but we can take that later as well. Okay. So Mithen, I'm just asking you a couple of questions that have come in. The first being is, are there any chondromalacia Patele, the changes of chondromalacia patella, which can be seen on an x ray. So, chondromalacia per se, if we take it literally, means uh, the cartilage on the patella surface is going wrong, something happening to it. So, you can't see cartilage on x rays. But if there is advanced patellofemoral arthritis or there is a, a patellofemoral subluxation, then you can definitely see it on a skyline or a merchant's view. So you can pick up proxy markers, but not directly chondromalacia itself. Yeah. Another one is, can Plica syndrome be diagnosed on x-rays? It can't, unfortunately. Uh, again, th there are certain reports or there's some evidence that chronic plicas can lead to fissuring of the femoral condylar cartilage. And sometimes that can be picked up as a small divot on the lateral x-ray. But by far and large, we can't pick it up on an X-ray. The last question that has come is, what investigations would you suggest for gout? Or are there any X-rays in particular that help you to pick out gout on, on a patient? So I would be predominant. Me be, uh, so I have a bias on this question. Great question there. Uh, because I'm a knee surgeon and I don't frequently see patients with heel pain or elbow tip pain. Who, uh, I mean, that those are the commoner presentations of people with raised uric acid levels. But I generally see gouty synovitis or arthritis where people will come with asymmetric single joint, single knee swelling. And uh, then you aspirate and you can look for either uric acid crystals or CPPD. And we differentiate between calcium pyrophosphate and gout on the basis of microscopy. Of course, all these patients uh, are advised an ESR, a quantitative C-reactive protein and uric acid. Perfect. Uh, one question from me is, this is mainly related to management of acute knee trauma, where you uh, and your slides excellently depict, depicted the heme arthrosis that you could pick out on an x-ray now in such a situation because this is quite common that the physiotherapist also sees on field uh, is there any acute management that is advisable for such patient well, is there any value for aspiration so, of the fluid is there any if value? you're on field or field side per se then of course aspiration and all of that goes for a toss all you need to do is uh, make sure that there is no dislocation look out for all the emergencies so we need to know that there is no neurovascular deficit. The tibia, the femur, and the patella are placed against each other. That means there's no persistent dislocation. And if these two things are ruled out, then all you can do is uh, go with the traditional uh, teaching that talks about icing, rest to that limb, and you can actually immobilize it in a long knee brace or any other splint that we have. Uh, no need of tight compression bandaging per se, though 
there are two schools of thought on that and there would be people who would be talking of using a crepe bandage on the knee uh, we believe that that would hamper uh, the icing per se so immobilization icing and rest very minimal role for limb elevation as well any uh, any indication for aspiration of such a patient uh, there are again so know, now assume that this happens and the patient comes to you in 48 hours to the clinic so the indication for aspiration is your clinical perception that the fluid is more than 50 ml or 60 ml so for and that you could reduce that to 40 as well so any so the normal knee uh synovial fluid levels are between 2 and 5 cc anything up to 20 to 30 cc the body can absorb anything more than that the body is going to take a lot of time and anything more than 40 to 50 cc the body will never be able to absorb so you need to help the body and you need to aspirate so how do you really estimate that is, is it's a uh, clinical judgment so they talk of these clinical tests where you see the patella balotment and all of that uh but what we try and tell everyone is try and see your regular patients more often try and look at the patellofemoral joint more often clinically so if you place your thumb and index fingers of both your hands at the superior and the inferior aspect of the patella and feel for the grooves in all normal patients including yourself you'll know how close the patella lies to the femoral condyles and then you can start uh seeing patients with effusions as they come along come your way to the opd and you will realize the difference between 20 cc 40 cc 60 cc and 80 cc okay uh excellent question another question coming in just now is uh, yeah i'm seeing that whether oa knee will affect height of the person uh is a mathematical question actually intelligent maybe if the varus deform i mean uh, i i can quote some literature on that though i don't know the authors that if the varus deformity is more than 25 degrees then they did some pythagoras theorem and they realized that the height of the patient reduced by certain mm i i don't remember the details but that uh, so what we want to know is whether so height may be reducing if legs go into varus or valgus but can the patient perceive it so the patient can perceive it only if the difference is more than 1.5 cm and for that uh, the varus and the valgus deformity needs to be substantial maybe more than 20 25 degrees great uh, i think that's all the questions and uh, you've stuck to our time limit so well done perfect and, uh, thank you everyone for joining us and for your patience so we were i was just wondering we were thinking of uh, taking the next sunday discussion on mris of the knee and shoulder chintan can do the shoulder bit and i can do the knee bit uh, we'd love to have your suggestions on uh, whether we should do this or we should take up some other topic of course we can't dwell into absolute details but i think what's clinically re- relevant needs to be discussed and uh, we'll try and ensure that we use your time fruitfully thank you for uh, spending an hour on sunday with us and hopefully we've justified your time Thank you thank you so much Chintan for being there and uh, helping me out with this thanks yeah bye